Well, it's good to be with you another Sabbath. Amen. Amen. And uh, we do second all of the exclamations that the snow is gone. Amen. And I'm still not sure how much spring we have, but at least we know we've got more than we had three weeks ago. We began our study last week by considering a question. A question that has been asked by each generation that has come upon this earth. And the question is, if a man dies, shall he live again? And we considered the question, where did death come from? According to Jesus, it was originally intended for Satan and his fallen angels. Interesting. Depart from me, Jesus said, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If sin had never happened in Lucifer's heart, and in the hearts of the angels that fell with him, we never know death. It came to mankind at their disobedience in Eden. We saw the scripture. God said, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Satan defies the deception about death because he thinks he can get around it. He thinks that it won't apply. In Eden, he confronted Eve. And in response to what he said, Eve said, Eve said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, you will not surely die. God knows your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. It's a lie. Satan has continued his lie from Eden all the way down to today. His lie revolves around the idea that man has an immortal soul and cannot die. However, the Bible, the Bible's formula, does not say that God gave us a soul. Let's look at it. We considered it last week. Let's remind ourselves of it. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God took the elements of this earth, the atoms, things that are common to this world. And he fashioned it, made us. And then he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Life only comes from God. And it produced a living being. Man does not have a soul. He is one. It's a difference. So, we asked ourselves, how could the following teaching take place? A well-known Christian leader was asked a question concerning death. And in his newspaper column, he provided the following. So here was the question that was asked of him. When we die, do our souls or spirits leave our bodies immediately and go to be with God? Or do they wait to go to heaven until the final resurrection. And here was his answer. My own study of the Bible has persuaded me that at death we immediately enter the presence of the Lord. Paul wrote that when we die, we are away from the body and at home with the Lord. He also said to his Christian friends, I desire to depart and be with Christ. 
These and other passages indicate we go to be with God at the moment of death. But the question that began our study, we noted last week, did not ask if a man dies, shall he really keep on living? It didn't ask if a man dies, shall he just change life forms? It asked, if man dies, shall he live again? That question indicates when a man dies, life has ended. And we want to know, will he live again? We're looking at the weight of evidence from four groups of evidence to determine if the viewpoint presented in that uh, newspaper column is correct, if it's accurate, if it's appropriate. And last week we considered the evidence from the first group, which was what the Bible teaches concerning the state of man in death and life after death. And here's a summary of what we learned from the scripture. In death, man is in the grave. It's not suffering. It's not hot, not cold. He's not in an intermediate state. He's not worried about those left on earth. He's not praising God. He's not watching us. They're not thinking. They're not haunting anything, but they're sleeping, waiting to be called to life by Jesus. So the evidence we considered last week declared that the position of the newspaper answer could not be so. But some said, oh, the scriptures that you used. The Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Job, they're unreliable, unreliable scriptures. But Jesus said of the scriptures in his day that they testify of him. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He didn't say, well, you've got to watch out for this, you've got to watch out for that. Not, not very reliable. Jesus didn't say that. And isn't it interesting that the people who say that these are unreliable scriptures, they are uh, okay for, quote, the Lord is my shepherd. It's okay for God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of need. Yeah, you can use them for that. But not okay for teaching that death is asleep, that the dead go to the grave and wait the resurrection. Now we're going to look at the second group of evidence. And the second group of evidence involves what Jesus taught concerning <coughs> death. What was it? We're going to look at the man Lazarus, the death of Lazarus. <coughs> and it becomes the means by which Jesus teaches us two simple and vital and powerful truths about death. The first vital, simple, powerful truth is found in the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, verses 11 to 14. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. And his disciples said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Well, where have we heard that before? Jesus is saying what the Old Testament said. Death 
is asleep. And someday the dead will awaken, and that leads us to Jesus' second vital and powerful truth. Still in John, the 11th chapter. And what Jesus is going to teach us is that life after death comes only by the resurrection through Jesus. The scripture says, Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said to him, Well, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees, as a group of Jewish belief, they accepted the teaching, the truth of the resurrection. But the Sadducees re refused it. They rejected it. And that is why they were sad, you see. <laughs> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live again. The resurrection of Lazarus illustrates these truths. Verse 38. Then Jesus, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted, lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. And he who had been dead, he who had died, came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him, and let him go. No. Take the words of Jesus. He did not command Lazarus, come down! Because Lazarus was not in heaven. He was not in some celestial location for spirits. Jesus did not command Lazarus, come back, come back here! That would have indicated that he was, had gone somewhere, anywhere. But there. But Jesus did command Lazarus to come forth. He was there. Everything that was needed for his life was there. And the life giver was there. And he resurrected. He gave Lazarus the power to live again. He resurrected him. Jesus gave him life again. I want to tell you something. Satan hates this truth. This act of Jesus was the turning point in his ministry. And because of it, you read further down in the Gospels, uh, 11th chapter, because of it, the Jewish church leadership would seek to kill him. So with the fact that he resurrected someone, gave him life. Years later, for his teaching on the resurrection, 
the Apostle Paul would be on trial and he was imprisoned. You can read it in the book of Acts, the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th chapter. Each one of those chapters mention the fact that Paul's in prison because he proclaimed the resurrection. I say again, Satan hates that truth. And he wants us to think that we can live on after death, that we don't need Christ. But all life after death is dependent on Christ through resurrection. That's a Bible truth. In John 5th chapter, verses 25 to 29, we learn that the resurrection of Lazarus is, is like a down payment to the time when all in the grave, all the dead, will hear the voice of Christ and come forth to life. Death is a sleep from which all... How, how much do you have when you have all? How much is excluded when you have all? Death is a sleep from which all will be awakened. Hear Jesus' words. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming. We're still looking. The hour is coming. And now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. We looked at Job, the 14th chapter, last week. And Job was describing that when a person dies, they go to the grave until they hear, until they're called, until they're called. Here it is. Jesus is, is stating that he will call. All who hear the voice of the Son of God will live. Verse 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. He says it again now. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good, that means accepted salvation to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, that means rejected salvation, so they'll die for their sins to the resurrection of condemnation. And there it is. So plain. Two resurrections are a subject for another time. Very important. The Bible truth is life after death comes only by resurrection through Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to the newspaper article. We'll reread the question and the answer from 2 Corinthians 5.8. Question, when we die, do our souls or spirits leave our bodies immediately and go to be with God? Or do they wait to go to heaven until the final resurrection? Answer, my own study of the Bible has persuaded me that at death we immediately enter the presence of the Lord. Paul wrote that when we die, we are away from the body and at home with the Lord. He also said to his Christian friends, I desire to depart and be with Christ. These and other passages indicate we go to be with God at the moment of death. That's not what Jesus taught. The second group of evidence, Jesus' teaching, says in summary, death is asleep. When we die, we sleep the sleep of death in the grave. We wait asleep in the grave until Jesus calls us to life at his coming. Life after death, only through resurrection. So, the evidence from Jesus and Jesus' teaching and his action says that the newspaper answer 
cannot be true. The third group of evidence involves looking at the two scriptures that the newspaper article quoted. 2 Corinthians 5 and then Philippians 1. Now we're going to consider the historical evidence of these two scripture teachings with the scriptures written by Paul, other scriptures written by Paul. And we're especially interested in the date of the book's writing and what it says about life after death. This evidence comes from three familiar and outstanding passages of Scripture. The first is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The second will be 1 Corinthians 15. I'm always tempted to read the whole chapter, chapter 15, at this time, but it, it's a long chapter, and for the sake of time, we're only going to look at some of the verses. But if you ever find a new English Bible, and can get a hold of one, and read 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful translation. And the third text will be Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Alright, so let's move. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture to us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Well, what's happened? What, what, who are those that have fallen asleep? They died. They're the dead. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. How did, how did Paul get this? He got it from the word of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, it's a personal coming, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, there it is, the call, come forth, and the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We already saw, indicated, two resurrections. The first resurrection is for those who died in the faith of Jesus. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know, according to what some people are teaching today, that the spirit already is gone and now the body is catching up, then they would be meeting, re-meeting in the air. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that they're going up to re-meet. It says going up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now let's ask ourselves the question. Feel free to answer when I, when I ask the question. I'd like for you to. Does Paul teach that death, in this passage of Scripture, does he teach that death is asleep? Yes, yes he did. Did he teach that the, that the dead are in the grave? Yes, yes he did. Does he teach that life comes again through resurrection? Yes. yes, he did. Does Christ come from heaven at his second coming to resurrect the dead in Christ? Yes. yes. All very clear, isn't it? All right, now let's look at 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to read uh, verses 3 and 4 to set the stage a little bit, and then you'll see on the screen uh, verse 12. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Who did, who did he receive it from? It's important. Where did Paul get his message? God from the Holy Spirit. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again 
the third day according to the scriptures. Now if this is what we proclaim, that Christ was raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, then our gospel is null and void. And so is your faith. For if the dead are not raised, it follows that Christ was not raised. And, if, and you are still in your old state of sin. It follows also that those who have died within Christ's fellowship are utterly lost. If it is for this life only that Christ has given us hope, we of all men are most to be pitied. But the truth is, Christ was raised to life. The first harvest, the first fruits of the harvest of the dead. For since it was a man who brought death into the world, a man also brought resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all men die, so in Christ all will be brought to life, but each in his own proper place. Christ the first fruits, and afterwards, notice, at his coming. That's a timing issue. It tells us when. At his coming, those who belong to Christ. But you may ask, how are the dead raised, and what kind of body? And then follows a good description of the resurrected body. Then Paul says, listen, I will unfold a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. That's an important word. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet call, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will rise immortal, and we shall be changed. Amen. No mention of um, returning a spirit with the body. No mention of that. In this passage, let's ask ourselves again these questions. Please respond. In this passage, does Paul affirm that death is asleep? Yes. Does he affirm that the dead are in the grave waiting resurrection? Yes. Does he affirm that the dead in Christ are brought to life through resurrection? Yes. Does he affirm that the resurrection takes place at the Christ's second coming? Yes. Does he affirm the redeemed are changed at the resurrection? Yes. Does he affirm that immortality is given at that time, the time when we are resurrected and changed? Yes. It's very, very clear. Now let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I think of this passage of Scripture many times when things are ugly in the political sense, and I just remind myself that my citizenship is not of this world. Amen. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Let's ask ourselves a question. In this passage of scripture, does Paul teach that we wait for Christ to come from heaven? Yes. yes. Does he teach that when Christ comes, then he will change, meaning transform our body? Yes. So again, we learn that we wait in the grave until Christ comes from heaven to resurrect us and change us at his second coming. Now, let's look at the fourth passage. 
we're going to compare what we've read in these three to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes, now, it's a time issue again. We, we really should have read verses 1 through 5. Because there Paul talks again about the new body to come. And what God has in mind for us. So he's already stated that. Then he says, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ. Now the common interpretation, the writer of the newspaper article had this interpretation today is, see, there's no such thing as sleep and death. At death we go straight to heaven. Now, also have to say straight to hell you didn't accept the plan of salvation let's hold that far let's get some more evidence in this third group and consider Paul's messages in view of the date in which he wrote them and what he said you know Paul didn't write in Microsoft Word I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing it's probably a one thing that uh, we would have had a whole lot more. Can you imagine what the apostles would have had if they had a video camera and a computer with word processing? Or, or even a, a cell phone would have been pretty handy. So with word, you get a timestamp. And you know when something was written. And every time that it was altered, added to, subtracted, whatever. date for Paul's writings is determined by indications found in the book and with other events that are noted. And by the way, just, just to let you know, 